So you pass the test. You're 17. Still? I'm about yeah, about 18 now. Okay, 18. Yep. You pass the test. Take us through the next uh, the next season here. So basically now, I want to be Air Force pararescueman. Right. And so, I couldn't even swim. And in special operations, I didn't even know this. There's only one percent of African Americans, you know, in in special operations, you know, totality wise, as far as Navy SEALs, Army right. Rangers, Green Berets. And let me ask you this: This is a good one. I want to ask: What led you mm -hmm. to this specific area of service? Was it random? It, well, my grandfather was in the military okay. for about thirty some years, mm -hmm. and I was obsessed with the military growing up. Mm -hmm. Just obsessed with with the uniform, and I knew that that was my way out, the military. But I didn't know you had to actually be intelligent <laughs> i thought it was just about push-ups and sit-ups sure sure so to be in the pair you know so so to be a pair rescue man they gave you this warning packet it's a warning order and after i passed the asvab test they gave me this packet it was like okay like a training packet mm -hmm. push-ups sit-ups flutter kicks all these different things the very last page talked about swimming i you know i figured i'm a pretty good athlete swimming is easy i'm negative buoyant so why there's not a lot of you know, African-Americans in special ops? Because over 70% of African-Americans are negative buoyant. Right. Which means they sink. That's right. And it's not due to muscle mass. It's due to bone density. That's right. So when I went to the pool, I tried to float. That's the first thing you have to do is learn, you know, just learn to float. I sank like a lawn dart. Yeah. I'm at the bottom of the pool, <laughs> walking at the bottom of the pool. So this lifeguard came over and said, hey, I can help you out. I've taught thousands of people how to swim. He tries to help me out. I lawn dart the bottom of the pool again. And when I come back up, he says, man, you're screwed. <laughs> and I was like, why? Yeah. That's when he started talking to me about negative buoyancy and right. stuff like that, how right. hard it is to stay above sure, water. Sure. So I put the same work ethic into my learning as I did in the swimming. Yeah. A few months later, I was swimming. And then I go off to pararescue school. So my whole thing was I wanted the, – the military was my way to find self-esteem. Mm -hmm. I had to start building on something. You know, and I started building on, you know, education. Then I had to start learning how to find mental toughness. And this is where I started finding was, was in the military. But once again, God threw, whenever life would start getting good for me, God would throw a nice anchor mm -hmm. and stop me right there. Mm -hmm. So I'm going through pararescue training, and there's this evolution called water confidence. Mm -hmm. And water confidence is pretty much... What gets people kicked out of special, you know, special forces, special operations is the water. Mm -hmm. And they try to drown you, pretty much. <laughs> I, this was not in the warning order. So I didn't know anything about water confidence. Long story short, what it is is they put 16-pound weight belts on you, whatever they can do to make you uncomfortable in the water. So for six weeks of a 10-week program, I became very uncomfortable. We got down to about 25, 30 guys left. I was one of them. And... Getting near graduation of this program, I'm thinking, my God, I'm about to get through this. Mm -hmm. Barely, though. Water confidence is killing me. Right. They took me to medical. They, they, they drew my blood and realized I have sickle cell. Yeah. So sickle cell is a blood disease that sure. some African Americans have, which is not good. No. So they took me out training for a week. And when you go from being uncomfortable, that's your lifestyle, you get used to being uncomfortable. Right. When you go back to being comfortable... Your mind says, I don't want to go back to sure. being uncomfortable again. That's right. So I was like, I don't want to go back to the water. So my whole mindset was, I want to get out of this training. So I was hoping that they were going to medically disqualify me from pararescue program. That didn't happen. A week later, the doc called me in the office and said, hey, guess what, man? We're going to put you back in the training. I was like, okay, well, I missed a week. I got about two and a half weeks left. I can do this. I went back to the, you know, to the CEO, the command officer. He said, hey, guess what? We're going to start you back from day one. And when he said that to me, my mind went back to the old David Goggins. So yeah. I thought I had changed. Yeah. Learning, learning how to swim, learning how to read and write. Mm -hmm. All I was doing was attacking the surface. Mm -hmm. I wasn't getting down into the dungeon of what was really bothering me. So whenever like, like, tough times would happen, yep. any tough time that would, like really tough time that would happen, I would go back to the sewer of my mind. Mm -hmm. So this happened. I went back to Lion. I said, hey, you know what, CEO? This guy, you know, the doc didn't know about sickle cell. He didn't give me a good reason why. He's talking about sudden death, heart attack, stroke. I'm not comfortable. So he gave me a medical from pararescue. So he allowed me to leave. Mm -hmm. But I, I really quit. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to go back in the water again. Right. And that's when I went from weighing 175 pounds to 297 in about wow. three and a half years. Wow. So I did a job called TACP. Yeah. 
yeah. controlling fast movers behind enemy lines. But that job wasn't a job that I wanted. And the spiral of depression, yeah. of trying to find things that I was comfortable doing. And whenever you find things that you're comfortable doing, you're going away from the journey of life. Mm -hmm. And I was going so far away from my journey yeah. that my weight showed my yeah. whole mindset. Yeah. Well, we're going to keep going forward, but I want to stay here for a moment because uh, one of the chapters that I've pulled out to talk about is chapter five, the armored mind. Yes, sir. And you talk a lot about negative self-talk. Yep. And we all have a negative voice. That's right. Some of us deal with it more than others. Right. Uh, some of us, we deal with it in different times. It manifests itself very, very different for all of us. Uh, right here in this story, I want to go right back where you left us. Mm -hmm. You lie, you get yourself out of that particular service. Right. And then you put on all this weight over three years. Was it the negative voice? How did the negative voice lead you to the weight gain and kind of keep you in the sewer, as you say? So the most important conversation you'll ever have is the one you have with yourself. Mm -hmm. You wake up with it, you walk around with it, eventually you'll act on it. Mm -hmm. And my self-talk was the most disgusting self-talk of all time. Mm. So the sewer of my mind, like I said, you have to go back in there and fix things. A lot of us are afraid. Like right now, 20 years ago, you wouldn't find me on this show. I was too embarrassed to tell you I stuttered, mm -hmm. I lied, mm -hmm. all these different things, getting beat up, getting bullied, whatever happened. But that's where the true transformation starts to happen. When you can look at people, anybody, thousands of people, one person and say, hey, this is who I am. And this is where I have to fix myself. Mm -hmm. And this is where it really happened. I thought it happened when I was in, you know, 19, 18 years old trying to pass this military test. Right. It happened here when I was almost 300 pounds spraying for cockroaches, mm. making $1,000 a month. Mm. And, you know, people called me dumb. People, my dad called me so many things, it's not even funny. Mm. Being beat just stripped me of all self-esteem. This is when I realized I was alone mm. on this earth. Yeah. I have God but alone on this earth, and I have to fix everything. So this is where I started to develop an indestructible mental toolbox. Okay. So... I came home one night after spraying for cockroaches at Ecolab, and literally I was praying at Steak and Shake, and I would go across the street to 7-Eleven. I had a 45-minute commute home. So I worked from 11 o'clock at night to 7 o'clock in the morning. Okay. I had a 45-minute commute home, and my, my stop would be, you know, Steak and Shake, chocolate milkshake, across the street, 7-Eleven, box of mini chocolate donuts, and I would <laughs> eat that on the way home. Yeah, sure. When I come home, I turn the TV on, I take my shake because the box of donuts were, I mean, they were killed. Oh, yeah. I kill those. Yeah. Go back to the back, turn the, you know, turn the TV on and take a shower. Listen to the TV while I'm taking a shower. This day, I heard these guys on the TV talking about Navy SEAL, toughest, class 224. So I heard stuff about Navy SEALs. Mm -hmm. You know, these are the baddest of the baddest. Yeah. And I'm, so I come out and I'm watching this show while I'm drinking my shake. And when you're watching a show of guys who are putting out there and they're quitting, quitting left and right, oh, sure. just can't handle it. They're going through hell week. They show them going through first phase, second phase, third phase, and they're dropping like flies. I looked in this one guy's eyes who was ringing the bell to quit, to put his helmet down out of Navy SEAL training, and I saw myself. And I saw what everybody said I was going to be, which was nothing. What I said I was going to be, that, that, that conversation you have, mm -hmm. that's who I was. So that's why I lied to people to tell them a different version of the truth. Sure. I had to make all those lies reality. Mm. I had to make them real. I had, I had to become a real person. So that's when I put in my mind that I'm going to go to the toughest military training on the planet. Mm. And where it has the most water, the thing I was scared of the most, mm -hmm. I had to go back. So a lot of us run away from our fears. Sure. And we box ourselves in mm -hmm. to... A, a lifestyle of this is all we can do. Right. Cause I'm afraid of everything outside this box. Yeah. So I'm comfortable inside this box. I jumped the box. Oh, you did, yeah. For the first time in my life. Mentally, I jumped the yeah. box and said, hey, I, I, I got to come out here and play. Well, what's interesting to me, and I want to talk about this for a second, because you made a real decision. You want to talk about jumping in the fire that night because you're 297 pounds. Right. So there's a lot of hard work that has to be done just to get you ready 
The if you can be task. ready That's right. to take on the SEAL training. That's right. So there was a lot of hard work. I want to point that out to our listeners <laughs> and our viewers, just to get yourself to a point where you can do what it is you set out to do. And the funny thing about that's not even funny at all. There's a good chance I might not even make it right. through Navy. So I, I had to lose 106 pounds in less than three months. Which is insane. Due to my age, due to prior service, due to the program we're shutting down that I tried to get into, the special program I was mm -hmm. trying to get into. I called up recruiters for two weeks and every recruiter was like, hey, you know what? You No, no. Of course, yeah. One recruiter named Steven Saljo, who's in my book, I talk about him a lot, well not a lot, just in that chapter. He told me just to come in and uh, he gave me a shot. So basically I had to lose 106 pounds in less than three months. And that journey alone was very difficult. The, the amount of ups and downs, the amount, oh. of, the, the amount of mornings I would wake up and just look at my shoes. Because my first run was a quarter mile. Mm -hmm. It was supposed to be four miles. Right. And I walked home right. and cried on my couch. Sure. Wow. So it but was. Uh, here's what I want people to hear. Sometimes, because it, it is intimidating. You just talked about it, how intimidating, how difficult right. the mountain was just to get a chance. Afraid. Yeah. Afraid. Ter terrible fear. Yes. Yet you made a decision. It is as simple as us making a decision. I'm going to do this no matter what. Is that essentially what happened that night in the shower? You know what? It was over a period of time that voice became haunting. When I was younger, I could get away from it a little bit. Right. When it becomes something that steady just pecks at you. Yeah all day long, mm -hmm. no matter what you're doing. Like if I was talking to you back mm -hmm. then, I was 300 pounds. Sure. I could be talking to you in this voice at the same time, like, what are you doing? What are you doing, man? You're a loser. Where, where are you going, man? This, mm -hmm. this is what you could do your whole life. Right. So it'd be talking to me as I'm talking to everybody. Right. It was almost like I had, I had two people. <laughs> right. And I'm like, good God, just right. shut up. Right. Just, right. I, I sure. want to be comfortable. I want to yeah. be left alone. I, I don't want to face all these things right. that, that life gave me. So you got to a point where you were sick and tired of hearing that voice. I was sick and tired of not facing the fact that I have, I've allowed life to make me feel like a loser. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us allow life to do that, yeah. and we accept it. And a lot of us talk about how we believe in God. Mm -hmm. We believe in something higher than us. Yeah. If that is truth, mm -hmm. you won't allow yourself to feel that way. That's absolutely right.